Hey, it's me. It's it's Bacho. Uh, I just wanted to say hello. Thank you for all the views that you've been giving me on my uh, Midsummer uh, long form Midsummer review. That's been very delightful for me to see. So thank you very much for that. I hate to break it, dear D, but today we're gonna do something a little differently. Okay, just just yeah. Uh, we're gonna review a book today. Uh, we're gonna review Stephen King's famous It. I imagine you probably all know about it. Oh, that's a really nice sound. Yeah. Ooh, bit of ASMR for you. Ooh, am I, am I American? Uh, am I American? Am I American? Like, cause I, no, I can't do that properly. Um, no, I'm British. I'm a British little boy from um, Sussex, actually. Uh, yes, yes, I'm a British boy. British boy, and I'm going to review a book today for you. So please enjoy. So recently I decided I wanted to start reading books again because it's a whole other medium of storytelling. I do mostly films and TV and games as well, but um, books I just, there's so much I haven't read and I really want to explore that medium again. In my adult life I haven't read that many books at all really. I've read the Song of Ice and Fire series or like the Unfinished series unfortunately. Um, I've read Dune, Dune Messiah and um, after I read this and then after the days following I have read Animal Farm because it was a very short book and The Metamorphosis because that was very lot of novella basically. I am really enjoying reading it's extremely immersive it's just like you instantly get hooked inside that world more more maybe more pungent than films immersion perhaps. That being said this was my first book that I read after the big reading hiatus I took because I read like Dune Messiah a couple of years ago before the Denis Villeneuve film came out because I wanted to be prepared. I wanted to see the Dune films having read the books first because I had never had that experience watching a film before. The reason I chose to read It was because it's obviously a Stephen King uh, novel and he's like one of the most famous, um, most accomplished writers, authors of all time. But it's also because it was just very interesting to me because there's The Shining, I could have chosen that or I could have chosen Carrie or Shawshank Redemption but I've seen the films that adapted those books and I really love those stories already. With It, I haven't seen a film that has captured my imagination for for It. It. I've seen the 1990 film now, but before I read this I'd only seen the 2017 and 2019 films. And they were okay, the first one was fun and entertaining, but the second one was kind of whack, honestly. All in all, there hadn't been a really good adaptation of It, so I thought that the purest version of the story I could probably get from the book itself, and I thought that'd be cool. It's kind of like what I did with Dune, because when I read Dune there was only the David Lynch film and that wasn't very good. Like, I'm already in love with the Lord of the Rings story because of the films, and if I read the books like I'm sure I'd like it as well but with the Dune story I fell in love with that for the first time reading the books and that hadn't really happened to me before. So yeah just a really intriguing uh, book really for me I really want to read it. And also there's this red letter media review of the It films and in that they touch upon the book and they made it sound really interesting. They said stuff like Stephen King was on coke the whole time he was writing it and that was like, he was just, it's just a coke fueled mess they described it as. And the idea of that was just really intriguing, just a guy who's just on fucking drugs just going absolutely crazy and just typing loads of just random shit. Well not random shit but just wacky stuff. I'd also heard other things about like the wacky sort of shit that was in this book and I was like kind of morbidly curious to see like for myself. Something that sounded pervertedly insane. All in all, when you say something is hard to adapt that instantly makes it sound intriguing and I'm looking at you Blood Meridian. I'm coming for you next. So just as a synopsis, I suppose I could just um, read the back flap of, of it. That would be cheating though, I'm supposed to like, you know, come up with my own words and descriptors or whatever. Um, so in the book you follow along two timelines, one set in the 50s and one in the 80s. The 50s is the childhood timeline and the 80s is the obviously the adult timeline. It's the same set of characters, just when they were younger and when they're older. And basically, at the start of the book, you're introduced to both of the stories simultaneously. Both narratives are set in this fictional town in Maine called Derry. And again, in both narratives, there have started to be a series of grisly, gruesome murders and disappearances. And these murders have been carried out by a monstrous killer clown. And that's not a spoiler, because literally in the first Georgie chapter, it's described to you as a clown. You see it. You see the monster. I Anyway, like, I'm pretty sure a lot of you are familiar with the whole it concept, so I don't really know if I have to elaborate any further. Without further ado, I just say we get on with the review, and I just want to say 
Thank you so much for watching, and we are back to the video. I'm going to start by talking about some non-spoilery positives, because there is a lot to love about this book. It gives you so much to chew on. In terms of actual narrative content this book delivers in spades, there are no individual chapters that felt poorly written or tacky in any way. I was entranced at every interval, and honestly it's hard not to be. This is obviously my first venture into the mind of Stephen King, who is a household name in the author trade. And given as though I'm quite inexperienced with the novel format, I don't really have much of a frame of reference as to how good the writing is, especially the horror writing, because this is literally the first horror book I've ever read. But regardless, from where I'm standing, this is a very well-written book, particularly when we arrive at the horror chapters. The spooky, scary stuff. The thing is about this book is it's so good and, like, um, I can't sit still because I've got ADHD. It was nice to see firsthand where Stephen King made a name for himself. I'd say the scary sections were a joy to read, but honestly, they were quite by design haunting. Really dreary and grisly actually. The man really knows how to conceive a sinister atmosphere, and once you put the book down, it takes a minute for you to be able to leave that place. I was reading this right before bed to make me sleepy, and I was going, why the fuck am I doing this? This is actually terrifying. Like, I'm gonna have horrible dreams. It does put you in a certain mood, and afterwards you have to wait a while for the atmosphere to dissipate. In this way, books differ from films quite a bit for me, because if I was watching the film, I just wouldn't have that experience. I'd turn it off and instantly be fine and back where I was. But with this medium, your mind is working overtime to envision the events of the book. And because of all those gears that are turning in your head, there is a cooldown period afterwards. It forces you to plunge quite far down into the depths of your imagination, and that kind of thing you can't just snap out of instantly. The best way I can describe it is it's like waking up from a really visceral, probably nightmarish dream, and that aura takes a while to go away. A part of you still feels that you're in that dream. But I digress, this is all to say that the horror aspects of this book work wonders on your brain. 10 out of 10 or whatever, uh, I don't know, this is really good, so shut up. You find yourself speeding through the pages at these intervals, and it's hard to put down, and I love it. Kino book! He applies great language to describe the gore in the most visceral ways, at times making you feel disgusted, at other times making you feel pain for the characters in peril, and at other times just making you smile at the sheer extravagance of the carnage because it's so imaginatively put across. There's one chapter in particular that really stood out to me, it's not in any of the films which is also cool. It involves these big flying tick monsters that suck big gulps of blood out of your skin. That was fucking awesome. So there's the moment to moment horror which is obviously brilliant, but there's also this perpetual malevolent aura that's always lurking throughout the narrative. The dreary tone of the book is ever-present and pronounced, and a lot of this is achieved through the world building, which is extremely meaty and comprehensive. That was really a surprise to see how extensive all that was. I can't go into too much detail because of spoilers, but the town of Derry is in of itself a character, and that character you could arguably dub as the main villain of the story. It's this entire town that feels haunted, and since the whole book takes place within this setting, each individual moment can feel threatening or sinister in some way. It also does a great job at establishing a sense of danger, as most of the casualties in this book are children, and when you show as a storytelling piece that you are willing to go that extra step, that darker, crueler place that a lot of storytellers shy away from, you can really make out the monster to be brutal and merciless. And in this book, children are the main target of the monster, it holds nothing back. From the outset, it proves to the reader that it won't be shying away from these heavy consequences, and for that, the stakes are raised. It immediately creates this precedent that any of these kids, any of these main characters, could die in horrific ways at any time. This clown is a very real threat, you do realise, like, he's not fucking around, man. He's just so mean, man, like, why? Come on, can you just, like, chill out a little bit? Why is it doing this? Why does it hate? Why is it so... So mean. All in all, there is a very justifiable reason to be afraid for these characters. There's a lot of child murder in this book, and it's grim as hell. It's a morbid, overwhelmed, and almost hopeless feeling you have throughout the course of this book. Because it's like, what fucking chance do any of these guys have, honestly? Well, why am I even fucking reading this piece of shit? 
There are seven main characters, and obviously for half of the book you see them as children, and for all of those instances you get the sense that any of them could die. They are up against a force that is fundamentally evil, like it gets off on the pain and sorrow that it inflicts upon its victims. It doesn't really get much eviler than this, but it's a great villain for that. Villain's a fucking understatement, because when you think villain you think of like, I don't know, Robbie Rotten from uh, Lazy Town or whatever the fuck that was. Wait, was that Robbie Rotten or was it something else? Isn't Robbie Rotten the guy from, like, the guy who sings and he swears and all the time? Also, um, what's that guy's name? You know, the guy who looks like Elvis, who died. Well, Elvis died as well, so, yeah. Um, unfortunately, however, a lot of these positive attributes are overshadowed by the structure and pacing of the book, which is all over the place. This is one sporadic, indulgent, ungainly beast. So what it seemed like Stephen King wanted to do was to make this big epic version of a horror story, but his sense of structuring is almost non-existent. There aren't really any cohesive acts, it's more so just a long series of suspense building chapters where the plot progression kind of resets by the end of each sequence. What I mean by this is you'll have introduction to character or place, gradual building of suspense, then the big scare, then chapter over, next chapter, the same sort of thing, just with a different character or a different place, and the cycle continues over and over again. Now again, these chapters on an individual level are really well written and engaging, but when it comes to the grander scope of the story, because it's structured this way, things can start to feel a little bit repetitive or stagnant. Honestly, usually I'm not such a stickler for proper story structure because it really doesn't matter to me, but here, the way it's done, it really does put the enjoyment of the novel in jeopardy. So that's why I'm compelled to mention it, because it does significantly impact your experience. Picture it this way, so imagine you're watching a film and you're coming to the point where it's the end of the second act and the third act is supposed to start any minute now, and then instead of a third act, you just get another second act. Like, that would fuck you up a bit, wouldn't it? It would mess with the momentum of the story, and that's probably one of the best ways I can describe my experience with it. With it, with it, with it, with it. You'll be hundreds of pages in, like almost halfway through, and then it'll decide to go, oh, hey, here's a whole new character and his backstory, and he's actually like really integral to the story, so you better like study up. Or on the other hand, it'll be, okay, here's the history of this establishment that'll only be in the main story for two seconds. But when you factor in that this was written by a coked up loon, it makes sense, and it kind of makes it funny. Oh yeah, this guy, this guy's brilliant. Oh, he's going in there too. Oh yeah, oh, we can't leave this out. Oh, 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 this place, it's hot. It's got its own history. Oh shit, oh god, I'll just need to put this in. Oh, oh, I'm one more thing, one more thing. It all stays. Mike Hanlon, who is part of the main seven, he only gets his first childhood-based introduction about halfway through the novel. Like, fucking hell, we've got another kid to establish. Like, isn't it time we started to get some payoffs? But no, it's just introduction, introduction, introduction. And then, of course, you read it, and the chapter's awesome. The kid gets chased by this giant bird. It's really cool. And that isn't in the film either. Fucking mid. Fucking mid shit. Who even directed that? Fucking Brett Ratner, honestly. And it's also the fact that the story's constantly jumping back and forth chronologically. What the fuck? I'd seen the 20th. 2017 and 2019 films before this, and how they work is the first film covers the childhood timeline, the second film covers the adult timeline, and I thought that's how the book would work, when actually the book has it so the two timelines are running simultaneously, like parallel to each other, and it keeps going back and forth. I will say it's definitely a more compelling way to structure it than the films where it's just one after the other, but oh my god, the whiplash from going to the 80s to the 50s all the time. The start of the book goes from Georgie getting killed by the gutter in the 50s to some random gay guy in the 80s getting beaten to death. And you're like, okay, oh fucking hell, that was going on. Oh shit, oh what's happening over here? Oh fucking hell! It's not that bad, but it's still kind of surprising. But it is hard because you get super invested in one timeline, and just when things are getting really interesting, it takes you out of it and puts you in another one where you have to start from scratch. You have to wait for the suspense to build up all over again. Despite all of these criticisms, however, I will say to its credit that it does all tie together thematically. There is a reason that you're shown all of these seemingly random events, and it gets more and more interesting. But there's fucking whiplash, there just is. Another thing you have to take into account is that there's seven main characters, and for at least five or six of them, you have to watch each of them undergo the same kind of narrative beats. To elaborate on this, I'll give you an example. So in the beginning, there's one chapter called Six Phone Calls. It takes place in the adult timeline, and it's Mike Hanlon calling the six other main characters and telling them 
the clown's back, you need to come back to Derry. And what happens is every character has like an awakening where all of these memories come flooding back. They have this strange supernatural amnesia over the events of their childhood and that starts to disappear. It is really intriguing to read because all of these memories come flooding back and they get this sense of trauma from their childhood. It's super compelling to read, it's just you have to witness six characters go through the same experience six times, well yeah. And obviously there is variations in how each of them deal with it, but they are quite similar to each other. And again, when you get to each chapter, everything starts again, it's like, okay, now we have to remember through this guy's perspective, and it's like, okay. But the point being, it's the same case with every important character moment throughout the whole book. So maybe the first few times when it happens, it's not that bad, but towards the middle, you start to get like a sense of how the book is formulated, and you can vaguely predict what's coming next, and it makes you less enthused to continue on sometimes. It's like this, it's like, Bill sees something that unlocks a memory from childhood and freaks him the fuck out. Next chapter. Richie sees something from childhood that unlocks a traumatic memory and freaks him the fuck out. Next chapter. Ben sees something from childhood freaks him the fuck out. <sighs> and obviously they all have different kinds of traumas and fears, and there is a variation there, but fucking hell, it's like... You can understand why people might get a bit irritated. It's fucking fat, look at that. Jesus Christ. A thousand pages, are you having a laugh? And again, I've said this numerous times before, but the chapters themselves, really good, really well written. I'm going to issue a spoiler warning, as what I'm about to get into may diminish your experience if you decide to read the book. So piss off, quick! Now this book throws so many different things at you in terms of subject matter, genre, themes. It's honestly rather overwhelming, but it's cool. There's this exploration into American history, there are explicit depictions of racism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, violence against women, all of the cool stuff. That's racist! It's an extremely horny book as well, for some reason. Like, really horny? A hornier than me? And not just the showcases of adult sexuality, but prepubescent sexuality as well. It's very graphic in those descriptions, and I was honestly going, Stephen, is that really necessary? Jesus. At the end of the childhood timeline, when they've defeated Pennywise for the first time, they're lost in the sewers because they can't find the way out. And all the kids are panicking and they're worried that they're going to die. They're like, we're never going to make it out of here. Oh shit, what's going to happen? So to calm everyone down, Beverly, who's the only girl in the group, systematically has sex with all of them, like, individually. And bear in mind, they're all 11 years old. It's presented like this wholesome thing, and I... Okay, um, it's supposed to be this spiritual coming together of the group. I'm pretty sure that's what he's going for. I could see that working if they were all adults, but they're fucking kids, man, like, literally. It's so descriptive as well. Oh, why do I have to always talk about this shit? Okay, so I suppose you are allowed to depict prepubescent sexuality as this wholesome kind of coming-of-age thing. It's a delicate part of nature, sure, but this is a fucking orgy, man. Like, come on. Enough of that! But listen, say if it was a kid getting a boner over a nude magazine for the first time. I get that. You can show that if you don't do it tastefully. But this... No! There are so many things in this book that if a film included, it'd make it so unmarketable. And it is kind of funny for that. On the positive end of things, the book spends a lot of time delving into the history of Derry, which you find out is extremely rich. It does a fantastic job at fleshing the place out, and it essentially portrays it as this fictional American town that's wrought with disaster and tragedy. Like, ever since its founding, it's always been doomed and haunted by atrocity. In fact, it's mentioned a few times throughout the story that Derry is just another kind of manifestation of the clown, of it. The inhabitants of the town have this tendency to mysteriously forget or overlook all of the tragedies and horrors that take place there. There's a supernatural force that's compelling them to turn the other cheek or repress these awful memories. And the more backstory you're given, the more you realise that this clown was present throughout all of these abhorrent events that occurred throughout history. Not only present, but most likely orchestrated or instigating them in some way. It, or Pennywise, kind of functions in a similar way as the 
monolith in 2001 A Space Odyssey. It's always at the very least present for something important regarding humanity, but you also get the sense that it's instigating something as well. And some of these atrocities involve the killing of African Americans at the hands of the Legion of White Decency, which is essentially like a lesser known sort of KKK type clan. But the inclusion of a lesser known racist clan that's been forgotten to history is kind of part of the themes of the story. And we know how America likes to repress certain parts of its history and pretend it didn't happen, only focus on the pretty surface level and never address the vile underbelly. And we get a perfect microcosmic version of that kind of attitude with Derry. This American town with this grim catalogue of nefarious events that most of the inhabitants just opt to brush off or forget. It's wonderfully allegorical and poignant and it can still be applied to today's events. Another cool thing that you're gradually made aware of is that Pennywise kind of bolsters the negative thoughts of humanity, in that if there's a character who's kind of a little bit evil or got some negative aspects about them, the very presence of Pennywise in the town can heighten those bad traits. It uses and manipulates the evil that comes naturally from our brains. You could describe it as a possession type dynamic, but it's a bit more complex than that. The evil characters still have a lot of free will about them, but the clown essentially exaggerates the worst aspects of our humanity. So say if you're gooning to furry porn and you think, okay, it's only once a month, so it's not that bad. Uh, if the clown started to wake up, you'd start gooning every second of every day and you'd go into a goon cave of hell. This is all just an amazing level of depth that the author goes into when it comes to fleshing out this evil force. It makes it so much more compelling than just, oh, evil, scary clown. I can only imagine that this was one of the reasons that Stephen King made this book so long, because he had all of this history of Derry to flesh out, as well as the clown and its existence. An evil that spans multiple millennia and represents all of these different concepts and themes. Another fascinating thing about the books is how the set of main characters as adults can't remember what happened to them when they were kids. It's only until they get that phone call from Mike Hanlon when they start remembering things, like they've pretty much entirely forgotten before that. It's ominous because it's a level of amnesia that's definitely supernatural. So this is why the book is structured in the way that it is, because as adults they're constantly remembering things from their past, and then it cuts back to the child timeline, then you see that new unlocked memory play out in real time. The adults almost have to undergo this therapeutic process where they slowly and gradually remember things. It'd be way too overwhelming if they remembered everything at once, it'd probably drive them insane. A cool detail that it includes in the book is that even though they've forgotten all of these horrific events from their childhood, they still, at least on a subconscious level, remember it. Because in their adult life, they have these extremely vivid nightmares that they can't explain. It's like, where is this fear coming from? But it's trauma that's indicative of something. It shows how dreams are this message from the subconscious. I also love the idea of having to return to your childhood to confront this traumatic event that's been haunting you. Whether you knew it or not, it's been plaguing your life. It's playing off that real life thing where people have these unresolved issues from their past. I love how they're all just old, aging and cynical as opposed to how imaginative and hopeful they were as kids. There's this other major theme in the book about how childhood imagination is extremely potent and powerful because of the faith it has in itself. It puts forth this sentiment that the mind of a child is so spiritually wholesome and mighty because of how fiercely it can believe in the spectacular. A child's mind is open to so many possibilities, which is why they're easy to frighten but also easy to inspire. And the clown which feeds on fear manipulates this to its advantage by predominantly targeting children. Children whose overactive imagination makes them more susceptible to being frightened. And it's a shapeshifter and it takes the form of various monsters from pop culture that are instilled into the brains of the children. It uses these horror icons and symbols that are extremely significant to the kids. Kids have a much easier time believing in fairy tales and the logic of films. When you're a kid and you come out of a film, you go, oh crap, I hope that doesn't happen to me. You can very quickly start believing in ghosts or that there's a monster under your bed, and that's what the clown feeds off. It feeds off the children's very belief and reverence of it. 
However, this also plays to the kids' favour, as whatever they believe in can be made so. They make silver bullets to try and kill the clown, and simply by them believing that the bullets can hurt the creature, they will that possibility into existence. You can defeat the creature if you believe you can defeat it. Again, kids can comfortably believe in the logic of fairy tales and these heroic stories. Adults, on the other hand, can't do this because they're too bogged down in rational thought and cynicism. Their minds are all made up and rigid, and because of this they aren't as powerful as the kids. And in this book, an element of the story is the adults having to channel their inner childhood again. Their inner childlike persona so they can wield this imagination again to defeat the clown once and for all. I just love how the novel incorporates the power of stories as well as childhood imagination into the plot. It's its own source of power. And also how it mentions that kids have an easier time compartmentalising these unexplainable things. When a kid comes across something that is out of this world or supernatural like a ghost, they have a quicker time accepting its existence. A kid sees a giant talking spider and they shit themselves, but they go, okay, I guess this is just part of what's in the world now. Oh crap, it's a monster, kind of thing. An adult sees a giant talking spider and they go into this existential crisis over what this means for the grand scheme of the universe. It completely breaks their rational brain and their worldview just crumbles. Honestly, reading this book, you'd think that Stephen King was a right old hippie, because there's not only all of this philosophical stuff about the mind of a child, but there's also all this crazy psychedelic stuff about the cosmos. Yeah, there's a cosmos in this, and it's called the Macroverse. It's the place where it came from. And all of these, like, giant behemoth entities reside there. These entities that are almost incomprehensible to the human brain. The characters have to go into this DMT state, where they enter this other plane of existence to fight the creature. They have this spiritual battle of belief. They come across this monumental turtle that created the universe after vomiting it out. It's insane, and I'm pretty sure none of that was in any of the films. What a fucking- how- why so mid? Why a film so fucking mid? I'm not at all versed with the works of H.P. Lovecraft, but this felt Lovecraftian, for what that's worth. That turtle in particular, mate, I fucking love that guy. That was fucking wonky. Stephen King had to be on more than just cocaine when he wrote all that, surely. At the end of the day, when it's all said and done, is it worth a read, should you pick this book up? I'd say yes, because this is a very special, wacky-ass novel. Despite all of the crazy things it does, and the sprawling scope of the story that almost is incoherent, it's a damn fascinating read. And ripe for reviewing as well, because it gives you so much to talk about. It's stimulating on so many different fronts, so many different emotions and genres. The directions it goes in, all of the various twists and turns are hilariously surprising. Yeah, I'd recommend this book. It's, it's insane. Just, yeah, you should you should read it. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of other books to read, possibly, but yeah, this is... It's... It is worth a read. I saw something. There was this... Clown. Again, I have seen the films, the 2017 and 2019 films, I don't remember getting any special experience from them. The horror direction of those films was unoriginal and derivative with all these jump scares and shit. That's not what Stephen King's about, man, don't be doing that. Very Blumhouseian, yeah, that's what it was. It Chapter 1 was entertaining enough because the kids were charismatic, but It Chapter 2 was fucking dog shit. Like, James McAvoy was not good in that, the storytelling was just obvious as hell. Almost everything about, like, how it was presented was just awful, actually. Like, it was laughable. It was like a SNL skit. Since reading the books, I've been looking at a few clips of It Chapter 2, and I'm just like, yeah, that's fucking stinky, man. It says it's your time. Oh, this is my time. <laughs> You know, Eddie. Huh? You know. And none of the characters are acting like actual people. It's just fucking... It's like this weird postmodern humour shit as well. You should cut that fucking mullet. It's been like 30 years, man. It's such a forgettable film that when I was reading this book, I was like, oh shit, all this stuff, this isn't in the films, this is all new, isn't it? But turns out it actually had happened in the films, but it was just so forgettable. It was just in one ear, out the other, because there was just nothing special about it. The 1990 film has this TV movie charm, but that's still pretty bad. I enjoyed it more because it was cheesy, but the acting is mostly awful. It's like the worst kinds of B-movie acting. <sighs> Oh, never.
It also just unceremoniously rushes through all of these different plot beats that don't really get any time to breathe. But I had an oddly nice time watching it, so there you go. Yeah, I found a photograph of George. George. Subscribe! That's all from me, folks. I hope you've enjoyed the review of this It book by Stephen King. One more bit of ASMR before you go. And yeah, thank you very much for watching if you're looking at me now because you've made it this far into the video. Uh, yeah, have a nice time. See you. See you later.